Good morning, Grace Christian Fellowship. Welcome to our online weekend services.
goodness, my God, that is who you are. You always make a miracle work, a promise keeper, the light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Good morning, beautiful people, and welcome to Grace Christian Fellowship Online. Today is Sunday, May 17th. We hope you had a great Mother's Day, and we hope the service is encouraging and helps build your faith. You know, the beautiful thing of this church online, you don't always have to wake up and get showered every morning. Sometimes, you just roll out of bed. That 
that's what I did today. And with that, the thought came to mind of come as you are. In Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here at Grace, we're all not perfect. We all stumble, we all have shortcomings. Some of us are messy at times, uh, but we wanna welcome you. We wanna know we're all serving a perfect and loving God, even when we're not. We thank you for joining us today. I look forward to seeing what's coming forward in the Word. Good morning. It is awesome to see you. At least it would be awesome to see you if I could really see you. Maybe, maybe it's awesome to see me. I don't know. For those of you that are older, maybe you remember uh, Romper Room. I wanted to have a magic mirror. Let's look through the magic mirror and who do we see today? We see Ted and we see Keith and we see John and we see Lynn Marie. And I said Lynn Marie because when we were little, no one, she never said her name because who would say Lynn Marie? Anyway, it is awesome to see you guys. And uh, I am really looking forward to seeing everybody again in 3D real soon. Um, have you ever been in a situation where you were not playing by the same rules as everybody else? When I was a kid, uh, we, had, we had a club uh, in the neighborhood, and it was just the guys. And i um, not really proud to say this, but it was called the Woman Haters Club. Now, we didn't make up the name. We actually got that from Little Rascals, but you can look that up yourself. And in order to keep the girls out, we came up with a code. And the only way you could join the club is if you knew the code, right? So our code was 4BC8. So you could join the club. 4BC8. And by the way, we made up that code in 1973, and yes, I still remember it. So the goal was to have this code so none of the neighborhood girls could join our club. Well, here was the problem. I liked the neighborhood girls. I wanted to hang out with them. And so I told them the code. And quite to the shock and awe of, of Steve and John and Joe uh, that all these girls joined our club, they just walked up and said, 4BC8 and then joined the club. And eventually it came out that yes, I cheated and I let them know and um, was ostracized from, from future club events. But sometimes that's the way it is with us and life, right? You and I, for those of us that are believers, those of us that have been adopted in the family of God, we play by a different set of rules, don't we? We do things above board. We do things honestly. We do things the way the Lord tells us to do it. People who don't know God don't do that, right? They don't have to. It doesn't occur to them. Why would they do godly things? They don't know God. So in John 16, verse 33, it says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Have you ever had trouble? I'm just guessing over the last couple of months, you probably have. Um, maybe it's been staying in your house with me for, for the last two months. Sorry, Lynn Marie and Colin. Um, and sometimes, you know, the troubles that we're in, sometimes we cause it, right? Sometimes we, we make a bad decision. We do something that is inappropriate. We don't look in our blind spot and we change lanes or we, I don't know, just make a bad decision. Sometimes we cause it and maybe we don't know we're the cause of it. And I've told this story before, but when Lynn Marie and I were looking for houses, our very first house, we discovered a house that I liked that Lynn Marie did not. I liked the house because it was really inexpensive for the size house that it was, and it was older, and so it had a lot of uh, you know, features that would be found in an older home that you wouldn't get in a newer one, and I've always liked stuff like that. But the great thing was, it was cheap. It was really, really cheap. And we didn't know why until we went back to the realtor's office. And on the realtor's wall, there was a map of Wauwatosa where this house was. And this house was in an area that is uh, near Hart Park. Actually, technically, it would be part of Hart Park now. Um, and it was in an area that said floodplain. But then there was a teeny tiny blue circle in the middle of that floodplain, and it said extremely hazardous floodplain. And in that little blue circle was the house that I wanted to get plus three other houses. And it turned out just a couple of years later after we bought our first house, not in Wauwatosa and not near Hart Park, uh, it got flooded. And then the following year, it flooded again. And so what happened was the uh, government came in, bought all those homes, tore them down, and made them part of the park. 
But had Linmarie not been smarter than me and we bought that house, you know, we were kind of asking for trouble, right? Sometimes the trouble is just random. Maybe somebody else is driving next to you and they don't check their blind spot. Sometimes our problems are caused by other people, right? Sometimes people inflict their will on us and, and sometimes we just have troubles with it and it kind of brings us down because they're playing by a different set of rules. In Romans 8, chapter 18, it says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Others inflict their wills on our lives. Sometimes it can be focused on you. Sometimes it can be focused on our society, right? People make decisions. Um, we have organizations that, that gather for political reasons for, you know, for this, um, you know, to do this or to do that. And sometimes it's, it's, it's in our comfort zone. Sometimes it's godly things. Sometimes it's ungodly. But that's why you and I need to be about our Father's business. And what do I mean by that? You and I are charged with sharing our faith with going out and telling people about who God is and what he's about, what Jesus did in our lives, what our lives have been like since we came to Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that it may so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people... But now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So once we were not God's people, right? We were like the people that we know now that don't know God. We were at one time inflicting our sinful will on the Lord. We were making decisions for our life, for, for things that we wanted to do, things that we wanted to have. And we were doing that without the benefit of knowing God. And some of us made good decisions. Some of us were nice people. Some of us were good people. Some of us not so much, right? You made decisions concerning yourself, things that you wanted to do, things that you wanted to have. And maybe those desires were good, but you went around it, you went about it in a bad way. You wanted to get that job, so you made somebody else look bad. You wanted a certain thing, and so maybe you cheated on your taxes a little bit to get some extra cash or whatever, it's all water under the bridge for you and I now, right? For those of us that know Christ, we are forgiven and we understand that. But we need to understand that all of us come from that. Now we make godly choices, right? Now we should be doing God's will and demonstrating that will, showing his light reflected in us. So when we want that promotion, we don't need to make anybody else look bad. We just do the best job that we can, right? When we want to have that thing or there's something that, that we want to do or want to have, we know that we are responsible for saving the money. We don't cheat God in tithes. We, we don't cheat on our taxes. We work for it. We save. We put money away. We do things in a way that reflects well on God because that's who we represent. In Matthew 28, verse 18 and 19, it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. 
you and I are responsible. You and I are responsible. We are responsible for making disciples, for going out and sharing who God is, right? It's not anybody else's responsibility. It's not Pastor Frank's. It's not Pastor Jim's responsibility. It's ours. It's everybody's. There aren't special people with this special calling, right? It isn't, it isn't Andy Gavin's job to gather huge crowds and, and introduce them to Christ, although that's what he does and that's what he likes to do. It is up to you and I to do it. We don't get an out. It's up to us to spread the word so other people can make godly choices, so that others can help change the world one heart at a time. For long, I've been a believer for a very long time, and I've seen some things, and we've done some things, not here at Grace or at Beth Messiah, but as a, I don't know, as believers in general, as a, as a global thing. Over the, over the centuries, over the years, we've tried to legislate godliness. We've tried to pass laws in order to make sure God's will is done. The whole, um, um, <laughs> we, Christians were responsible, were responsible for prohibition, right? For making the sale of alcohol illegal. The, the whole temperance movement began out of churches. And so our job was to save people from alcohol, or at least that was the thought at the time. And so we pressed legislators to outlaw alcohol. It didn't work. I mean, it really didn't work. We got the rise of, of organized crime. We, we got you know, the, the problems in Chicago, the problems in New York, all sorts of stuff, because we were trying to legislate things that really people need to make personal choices about. And how do we do it? And I think this is, where, this is where a lot of people start to panic. You guys know, and I've told these stories a lot, I have, I have some fears, right? I do not, I do not like to fly. Let me say that one more time. I do not, I'm gonna, so going to regret seeing that on video. Anyway, I do not like to fly. It scares me. It is irrational. It is an absolute <laughs> irrational fear. And I've tried hard to overcome it. I thought I did really well for a while. Turns out, not so much. There are other things that I don't like, like, uh, for instance, I used to be afraid of heights, but not so much anymore. You know, there's something about being a homeowner with a two-story house that has to get up on a ladder to fix stuff on the roof that you either get over it or you spend money. And let's be fair, my ability to be cheap overcomes most of my fears. So going up on a ladder, up on the roof of my house, not a big deal anymore. And I can do that and it's not a big deal. And I overcame my fear because... I was able to see that it really wasn't something to be fearful of, right? Of course, you want to be cautious. If you're up on your roof, probably not a good time to take up yoga. Um, probably don't want to do, you know, I don't know, wind sprints from one end to the other. But as long as you're careful, you're cautious, you know what you're doing, you're careful getting up and down the ladder, it's really not something to be fearful of. And the same thing is true with sharing our faith. And most of us really do freak out about it, right? You, you, think, about, you think about all the things you can't do, all the things that, you, that, that just aren't natural to you, right? Going up to somebody and, and, and handing them a piece of paper with information about God or, or grabbing someone from, by the lapels and just shaking them and telling them about God, right? That's not what we do. It's not what we should do. But that's what we're afraid of, that we're going to be asked to do things that are way outside of our comfort zone, right? Uh, the past couple of years, um, uh, Andy has and I'm sorry, Andy, but I can't remember the name of the program, where we've gone into prisons to share our faith. And not everybody participates in it, but the people that have, there's training involved, right? They don't just throw you in there. They actually help you do it. And they help you learn and, and, and teach you what to, what to do and how to be careful in a prison and all this other stuff. And it's a great program. And it's a great thing to do. But our call on us isn't for special occasions. It's for every day. It's in everything that we do. It's in our interactions at work. It's in our interactions at the grocery store. When we're getting gas, uh, <laughs> even when we're driving on the freeway, those are the times that we need to be representing God in every moment of our life. And when we're afraid, it really is the enemy's way of keeping you from doing what it is that you're supposed to do. When Lynn Marie was growing up, for those of you who don't know, Lynn Marie is my wife, um, uh, she has five older brothers, and they are awesome men. Um, I have absolutely enjoyed being their brother-in-law. Um, her brother, Dennis, uh, is the closest in age. He's six years older than she is. And when they were growing up, they would stay up if, if their mom went out or mom had to work late or whatever. 
they would stay up late and they would watch scary movies. And not scary movies, but the kind of scary movies that, you know, you'd find on just regular, you know, regular TV, right? Back back in the back in the day before cable. And um, Dennis would tell Lynn Marie stories about Oscar. Oscar was the monster that lived under the couch. And Oscar would grab little children and drag them under the couch and eat them or kill them or something. I don't remember the full story. But he was so good at this, he even drew a picture of Oscar one night and scared Lynn Marie so much. Well, during the movie, Lynn Marie got up and she went to get something from the fridge. And when she came back, Dennis was gone. Didn't know where he'd gone. And she started calling out, Dennis, Dennis. And when she walked past the couch, a hand shot out from underneath the couch and grabbed her ankle, which freaked her out quite a bit. She cried, uh, got Dennis in trouble for freaking her out the whole nine yards. But ultimately, that's all the devil is doing to us, right? That's all the enemy is doing to us. He's telling us stories. He's trying to freak you out before you get it. It's, he's telling you how bad the race is going to be before you even line up to run it. He's, he's telling you how bad you're going to be before you even get a chance to do it. And it's just not true. It's just not accurate. You and I are required to tell the world, each and every one of us, God wants his will accomplished. And the only way for that to happen is for us to do it, to be participants. The Bible teaches us that if we ask anything according to his will, it will happen, right? There is nothing, I suppose, maybe there's more things according to his will. But one of the biggest things is being able to share the word, being able to share the gospel, being able to talk to people about it, being able to have the opportunity to share the gospel with people, right? So it starts with prayer. It starts with you asking God for people to share the gospel with. It starts with you asking for the Holy Spirit to show you how you can share the gospel. You personally, right? You're different than I am. And, you know, what we can do well, what we can't do well, it's probably going to be different. And it's going to be different from other people that are watching this video. And so we need to know what it is that we're good at. We need to understand how it is that we interact with people and interact with the world that allows us to share the gospel with them. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in, the, in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault, in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. So it starts with prayer, but you also have to be living God's life, right? God's life for you. Love helps its neighbors. It just does. And, I, and, and there may be opportunities now with the way things are in our community to allow you to demonstrate God's love in ways that we haven't had a chance to before. Or maybe in a way that, that you hadn't thought of before. That is necessary now. And when you are living God's life, and not just in helping and not just loving, but loving God, right? And so living the life that he wants you to live, being the hardworking, honest person that he needs us to be, by being the loving spouse that he wants us to be, or, or the good parent that he wants us to be, whatever it is, people will see that. It will attract people. People will want to know why it is you do what it is that you do. Why do you always smile? Why do you always laugh? You won't have to go look for people. People will come to you. They'll want to know what's different about you. <laughs> People always ask me, what's different about you? Probably not always in the way I want them to, but they do ask. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, it says, But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Be prepared to give the reason why. Think about it. What is it that God's done for you lately? What is it? You know, I, I've, I've heard from some of you and, and know 
excuse me, that some of you are, are taking this time that we're stuck in our houses to do extra studying. Um, I, believe, I, I believe a certain person is, is studying Psalms right now. Well, what is it that you're learning about? What is it that God is showing you? What is it that God's teaching you in these moments? These are great things to remember. These are great things to think about. Why do you live your life the way you do? What difference does it make if you're the hardest worker? What difference does it make if you won't lie? What difference does it make if you do things to make sure that you reflect well on God? What difference does it make? People are going to want to know. Why are you so different? You can write it out, but it's good to have it in your head. And here's the thing. You don't have to do the convincing. It's not up to you to sell God. It's not up to you to convince someone to become a child of God. That's the Holy Spirit's job. The Holy Spirit has come to, to convict, right? Not us. And so we show the Holy Spirit draws and we can lead them. But it's not up to us to convince them. You don't need to know all the answers. You don't even need to know most of the answers. You just need to know some of them. And people will come to you and you'll have a reason. Why are you as happy as you are? Why is it do you always laugh ridiculously? That's the one I get most. And I do laugh ridiculously. And I'm pretty sure you guys are still hearing my laugh, even though I haven't seen you in two months. It's supposed to be really nice this weekend. Open your windows. I think the wind is going to be out of the west. I'm sure my, my laugh will just waft in from Waukesha. You can all hear it and smile. <laughs> but it is up to us. And it's not a suggestion. It's a command. And people right now, it's funny. Um, I work in the life insurance industry. And for a long time, the life insurance industry has been stagnant. Oddly enough, over the last few months, people have been thinking about life insurance more and more. They understand more now the purpose of protecting their family financially in case someone passes away. Well, I will guarantee you that people have been thinking about eternity a whole lot more these past few months. And you and I have the answers. You and I can point them to the one person that knows, the one person that cares the one person that can do something about their eternity. So they don't have to worry about it. They can think about other things, but they don't have to worry about their eternity. When you were young, did you ever do something you weren't supposed to do? Before I came to Christ, that's all I did. <laughs> uh, a lot. And um, I was not a good student. I was a smart kid, but not a good student. Um, I decided that seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, I would do other things other than homework. Um, or schoolwork, or pay attention, or turn things in, or read stuff. And um, my grades suffered as a result of it, and uh, I was grounded for 7th, 8th, and ninth grade. And when I, when I say grounded for 7th, 8th, and ninth grade, I did get summers off for good behavior. Um, but on a daily basis, my job was to come home from school, nobody in, nobody out. I couldn't go hang out with my friends, and I was to do whatever schoolwork was assigned, no TV, nothing. Um, I made the choice of continuing to not do my homework, to not do anything, even with these punishments. It became a battle of wills, and it turned out I was a stubborn idiot. But anyway, that was my job. That's what I did. Well, in Milwaukee Public School, and I don't know if it's still like this, but, but back, back in my day, report cards would come out every six weeks. And I was grounded every day. But when the report cards came out, it was special for me because then it just reinforced that I was still failing. It was still reinforced that I was not the student that I should have been. And it would get particularly bad at home. So what did I do? Well, they would mail the report cards home. So I would intercept them and I would throw them out. Now, I know that every child thinks that maybe their parents aren't the smartest people in the world. That maybe, you know, you know better than your parents. But here's the thing. My dad has a PhD. He was a commanding officer in the military. Um, very smart man. He could count to six. And he knew the report cards came out every six weeks. He knew when they were coming out. He knew the beginning of the marking period, the end of the marking period, and approximately when the, when the report cards would be coming in. And somewhere, I don't know, it must have been eighth grade, he just got tired of it. 
And so it came to the market period. The report card came. And I threw it out. My dad came home literally that night. Looked at me and said, hey, report cards come out. Did we get your report card today? I said, no, sorry, Dad, didn't see it. Must have gotten lost in the mail. And he said, that's okay. I went to school and I got one. That was a bad day for me. <laughs> it, was a, it was a very bad day for me. But I knew I was just prolonging the inevitable, right? If I had stopped to think about it, it may have made my Thursday better because the report card didn't come on a Thursday. But it was going to make the following weekend that much worse when it showed up. And it just... And, and what it was that I had done wrong and everything else that I did that I had to fess up to, it just made my father angrier. It's not that different with us. There are consequences to our actions and our inactions with our Heavenly Father. We know that God loves us infinitely. But whether he's pleased with us or not, that's up to us. And there are consequences if we don't do what God has for us to do. And the problem is it's not just consequences for us, right? It's consequences to the people that we meet on a daily basis. It's the, it's the people that we meet that we don't share the gospel with that have the worst consequences. When I was in uh, New England with Covenant Players, and again, I probably told this story a gazillion times, but um, I was walking down the street and there was a woman, uh, this was in, in Maine, I don't remember what town in Maine anymore, but she was sitting on the front stoop of her house and she was smoking a cigarette and I walked by and the Lord, I believe wholeheartedly that the Holy Spirit said, you need to go, you need to go witness to her. And I, I totally, no. And I went into the drugstore to do what I had to do. And the Holy Spirit said, I really need you to go uh, witness to her. And I, and I, I refused. I, I had stuff to do. I was, I was embarrassed. Isn't that sad? Isn't that sad? Um, but I, I said no. And I was waiting in there for other people. And the Holy Spirit said, I want you to go witness to her. And finally, I relented. And I went out. She was gone. And obviously, that was in 1989. I still regret it. I still feel guilty about that. I still pray for that woman because I don't know if she came to Christ or not. I don't know if she's still alive or not, and I'm not going to give up. And I hope someday that my prayers worked and somebody who was more willing to be a tool of the Holy Spirit did their job that I was unwilling to do because I don't want to bear the consequences of that person not being in heaven. And these are things that we can do every day. And especially now, right? Um, I went grocery shopping last week and uh, wearing a mask, and I, 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 I wish I, I was going to wear it tonight. I was going to show you what I look like so you could see what I look like when I'm shopping. Um, it's not pretty. It's not good. And my glasses steam up, and it's not good. And, um, but I had a great time um, grocery shopping because nobody was being nice to each other. Nobody was, was willing to go out of their way. No one was willing to wait for somebody else. The lines to get out of the grocery store were incredibly long, and it was confusing, and people were skipping. I had the best time letting people go in front of me. I had the best time letting people get past me in the, you know, pulling my cart back and letting them do their shopping beforehand. And, you know, obviously I couldn't, people weren't all that willing to let me help them load their groceries because they don't want me touching their stuff. But it made other people's days better. And did I get to talk about God? No. But I'll tell you what, I had more opportunities or at least the possibility of an opportunity by doing things like that than I would have by being a jerk, right? So look for ways. And all you have to do is talk about what God is doing today. And it should be as natural to us as when you and I talk. If I asked you, if, I, if, if we were back in church today and I walked up to you and said, what's God doing in your life? You'd have an answer for me. Or, or if I asked, hey, why are, you, you know, why are you so happy today? You'd have an answer for me. It's no different than anybody else. It's no different than anybody else. You and I need to make good, godly decisions about what we do, what we say, and how we do it. Because there's a world that needs it. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is, is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That's us. And we need to introduce more people to it so it can be them too. Help them see. Point them in the direction. You don't have to do the convincing. You don't have to do a sales job. That's not what we're about. 
We're about pointing out the reality of what God is doing in our life, period. And it will work wonders because the God of wonders is behind it. Let's pray. Father, as always, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for direction. I thank you for help. I thank you for your love. I thank you that, that regardless of where we are in our walk, how long we've known you, how long we've been with you, that there's always something new to know. There's always something new to glean, something new to share with other people. And Father, help us to focus outwardly in a world that needs you. Help us to focus on the, on the individual people that we meet, the, the individual touches that we have on a, on a regular basis, Lord, on a daily basis, the people that we run into at the, at the gas pump or at the grocery store, Lord. Help us always be a good representative of who you are and of your kingdom, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Peace that only the Lord can give you. Amen. You are with me. What can separate us? You are for me. What can stand against us?
promises never fail. Your promises never fail. I know your thoughts, your plans for me are good. And I know you hold my future in my hope. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Your promises never fail. Shine.